Okay, here we go, and welcome back to the Bandwidth Kaleidoscope Ears with my uh, co-host James Corbett. How are you doing tonight, James? Or today in Japan? Yeah, it's uh, morning for me, so I'm wide awake. Morning for you. Yeah, yeah. Doing good. Good to hear it. Uh, So, folks, today we're going to stray very far from our normal Beatles territory and go into Baroque music. We're going to talk about the found footage of the great classical composer. uh, Well, before I name the composer, the the film, which is uh, soon to be released, is called Get Bach. Get Bach. And... uh, (coughs) All right. (laughs) But... um, Yeah, right, exactly. I I can't wait for Brock to add his little effect. (laughs) (laughs) No, actually, we are straying a little bit from our usual, and we're going to go out of chronology, and because the Get Back movie was released. So we're going to talk about the song Get Back today, you know. And uh, normally, I mean, normally you would talk about a little bit of context for the song. Do you think we should... Yeah, I was going to say, I am more useless than tits on a monkey in this one, because I would generally, yeah, I would introduce it by talking about, oh, and they were in the studio on this day and whatever, but people can go watch it. You can go actually watch this song being created. How awesome is that? And I'm going to bring up a disclaimer. I, there, like Matt Williamson so well put it, he said, uh, there are casual Beatles fans and hardcore Beatles fans. A hardcore Beatles fan would watch all three hours and just love every minute of it. All Casual s- one. All seven and a half or eight hours or whatever. Y- yeah, right. Yeah. Um, uh, an example, my good friend Matt, he's a, more of a casual Beatles fan. He, he respects and loves them, but he said, you know, I, I was watching the first part and I just got bored. I've done this with bands all the time. It's just the same old thing. And I told him, look, the payoff is in two and three. You should really watch it because that there really is payoff there. Um so there's that. Anyway, you know, James, I'll be quite honest with you, and you probably know this of me. I, I always cram the same day for the podcast, and I did a little bit of crammage, but uh, I didn't go. I didn't take any notes. I don't have any charts. I haven't done anything. And the reason why is because I have a distinct notion that what we're going to eventually flow into is talking about the Get Back documentary. <laughs> so... Um, which I think is worth talking about, even though there's a gazillion podcasters talking about it right now. Um, I just ran into a three-hour podcast uh, with Peter Jackson. Things We Said Today? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I haven't exactly. heard it yet, but I want to. Yeah, yeah um, I don't know. After a while, I was like, I had it on in the background while I was doing stuff, and I realized, oh, I'm not really listening to this. you know. So I turned it off. I don't know how good it is, so I couldn't recommend it or not, but uh, yeah. Anyway, we are talking about Get Back, um, and I, I'll go into, should I just go right into the quotes, music theory on this, because there's not a lot. This is a really, really basic rock Wait, song. let me have a crack at it. We have a grand total of three chords in this song. We have A, G, and D, and it seems to me to be rooted on the A. So that would imply we're in the key of D, but we're rooted on the A, so clearly this is A Mixolydian. Thank you, everybody. Go home. We're done. Bravo. (laughs) Nice round of applause. Um, Yeah, yeah, that's true. However, there's a fourth chord in there. I don't know if you remember a moment in the movie. um, Paul walks up to... uh, Oh, God, my name... His name is escaping me, the, the keyboard player... Uh, Billy Preston. Billy Preston. Paul walks up to Billy Preston and said, you know that chord that you do? He goes, put it there. And the chord was that. Which is a six, right? It's, well, uh, a six. I don't know which, A6? I don't know. (laughs) I just sounded (laughs) sixy. Well, it's in the context of... Uh. Right? In a sense, you could say that's another chord. In a sense, you could say not. Now, I watched the Beatles really closely when they were playing this. Um, first of all, an interesting switch of roles here is that when you look at early Beatles, earlier Beatles footage, 
John did the more basic rhythm guitar parts. We're using the cowboy chords and, and George would be doing the interesting little inversions and things like this. This is reversed. George is playing. Nothing going on there. He's just playing like it was an acoustic guitar. Uh, John, on the other hand, is um, doing the classic rock and roll thing. So there's that going on. Now, you and I discussed off camera, uh, like the, the lick that's in um, uh, Dig a Pony and the jump that has to be made down, down from the open A string back to the lick. So you get... Uh, getting to that G is like, boom, it's a jump, right? And I, I cheated on it. Well, it's not a cheat. I just didn't use my first finger to get to back to that G. I used my middle finger because then off of the A chord, I have my middle finger free, so I don't have to go like that, right? So then that becomes... Uh, and it's seamless that way, right? So that's what I would do. I would just change my fingering for it. Now, the reason I bring this up, there was another song even that we talked about. I forget what, but there was another song that, that had that kind of difficulty in it where you have to make this quick jump. Maybe it was the Kodomo song, uh, son song. Was it that? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Right, right, because you have to do that. Yeah. So uh, one thing I noticed, and I can't play this yet. I should have practiced it, but it's so hard that I can't just knock it off real quick. It's a thing I would need to practice to get right, and John does it. Interestingly, I, I'm not usually very interested in what John's doing on rhythm guitar. I'm usually more interested in George's work. Uh, but in this case, I was focused on John, and I'm realizing, wow, this is, you know, I tried to do what he did, and I'm like, wow, that's hard. So uh, what he does is in the chorus, he goes... Oh, sorry. Right? To do that. That, the, the jumping in there, that's the leap right there. And again, I would have changed fingering for it to, to cheat a little bit, I'd go, so I'd put the G over there rather than there so I didn't have to jump. But it's even, even without the jump, it's, it's kind of tricky. He's jumping from the bass lick onto this high uh, chording part. And I think he does a spectacular job of it, which again, you know, people question, oh, you know, uh, is, is John really a good guitarist? John did really difficult things on, on the guitar. Uh, the things that, kind of things that you'd have to work out. Uh, the example I always give is, um, um, and I'm not even doing that right. All right, because he adds like the bass note in. Uh, I can barely do it. And he did this on an acoustic guitar in the 60s when the strings were really heavy on acoustic guitars. So I saw him perform it live at an acoustic in one of the shows. Mm -hmm. So there you go. He was no slouch. Um, yeah. Okay, so if we're going to do a bit of Get Back documentary analysis, uh, I don't know where I heard this. I'm sure someone remarked on this, but um, it seemed like they were giving John things to do to keep him engaged because... John was kind of zoning out at this point, and quite, I think, visibly so in Twickenham. He seemed uh, 
And obviously there was this famous two junkies interview around that time. So uh, right, right. it was what I, I think I commented either with you or with Anthony Rutuno. I don't know. You're all the same to me. You're all not me. <laughs> but I was talking to someone where I said the thing that was exciting about the trailer was that, wow, John looks so present and so like full of life in the trailer yeah. that they showed. Mm -hmm. And that's surprising because this is John during the, you know, junkie period. And we all have the sense that he was not quite there. Right. But and it, I think it's like that in Twickenham. But then when they move into the Apple Studios, he seemed to be very much John, which uh, was great. But I think that was something that people were pointing out. Like, they were giving him things to do, like the lap uh, steel guitar or whatever. Oh, that's interesting. That's yeah. an interesting thought. Yeah. So in this yeah. case, yeah, you would give that to George, right? George would be doing the interesting lead thing. But no, mm -hmm. John's doing it. Maybe so. That's so funny, you know, John's little comment about... Now I know why I never get the lead guitar parts. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right? Hey, he did it. Good for him. But again, he did that kind of switching off. Um, he would, um, he'd be doing this. Uh, oh, sorry. Like that. Um, where, where does it come in? And he'd have to jump back. And what I noticed he did was he'd go. So he'd leave a beat out in order to get to the chord. I've, I've had to do that myself. But, yeah, I don't know if that was part of the plan to keep him busy because that is challenging, you know. So, yeah, maybe, maybe so. Maybe so. If so, it worked. <laughs> it seemed to work. Now, we, we can talk a little bit of music theory, all right? Not a whole bunch, but Mixolydian is really essential and important to rock and roll music, and so it's worth being touched on. Now, the, the step of the scale upon which the dominant seventh chord lay is the fifth step of the scale. That's the, like in the key of C, the G7 is at the fifth step, all right? Now, here's we have a crossover between the two, two different systems at once merging. And one of them is the Greek system of Mixolydian, and the other is the American system of blues. Okay, when the dominant seven becomes a one chord, uh, that, that's indicative of blues, even if it's major. Okay, even if it's major. Now, John soloing is mostly major, like pentatonic. <laughs> That sort of thing. But then he goes. And you hear the blues right away in that. Now, the funny thing is. Uh, the, the Beatles, I mean, George is playing just straight major chords. There's no sevenths in what he's doing. I watch them closely. I just put an eagle eye on him. It's just A, G, D. That's what he's playing. All right. So. Um, yeah, so. When you have a D chord and you hit that, it gives you a D7, right? Another, in my blues clues, I talk about this, that the one of the indicators of blues is the four dominant seven chord. That's blues right there. So here's the thing that happens with Mixolydian. If you have a progression that uh, akin to get back, where you say something like... Mixolydian progression in A, key that get back is in. Now, I could play, it would sound like country rock if I played. I'm playing a major, A major pentatonic, but equally, I can do the my A minor pentatonic. fit across all those chords but give it now a taste of blues okay uh one musician who is actually you know he's done a lot of dorky stuff but i do have respect for him is eric clapton um in his early days you, you i mean should he clarify was, you mean dorky musically right you're not referring to his uh, po political stances 
Oh, no, I, I respect his political stance. You know, I, that's me personally. But uh, well, his, no, his no, recent I, political stance, not what he got secured for in the 1970s. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, can of worms, right, right. can of worms, <laughs> whole can of worms. <laughs> I was I was actually, you know, I, I saw what they did to him on Twitter. It was despicable what they did to him just for speaking his truth. It was just evil. They brought up some evil human being or bot or whatever the hell it was paid troll uh said something about his kid who died you know fell from a mm. i think it was in manhattan fell from a building like how how dare you how, ooh, that's just awful anyway on to happier stuff though. sorry yeah uh, eric clapton was a master of that moving from the major pentatonic to the minor pentatonic and when you move from the major, the, 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 the actual order of it should be from major to minor. Because you think of blues as a spice that you're adding into the stew, right? Uh, you don't want to necessarily, it depends on the kind of stew it is, but you don't want to necessarily do all spice. Again, depending on the, uh, depending on the type of stew it is. But um, Would you be um, able to demonstrate minor to major instead? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Let's see. So there's a song that was ghostwritten by George Harrison that he gave to Cream, and the song is called Badge. And I don't know if you've ever heard this, but it's got very similar lick to uh, Here Comes the Sun. And that's, that introduces the guitar solo, which is Mixolydian and D. So he, he, he straddles between major and minor when he introduces it. It's a beautiful solo. I used to listen to the song over and over again just to experience the chill up and down my spine. That, that's how great that solo is. But um, that's not just major, but it's not even mixolydian. It's actually the major scale. But again, dissonance in context like you brought up on that podcast recently. It was a great point you made about dissonance depends on the context. Uh, also, it depends on how long it lasts, right? So, and I'm going to bring something up about Get Back, that John breaks a cardinal rule of mine twice. And it even bothered me when I was younger. Um, but anyway, so here's the Eric Clapton. Uh, that's minor there, but here's major. That's major, all major. Now listen to this. When that moment comes in, it's like, uh, it really brings out the blues element. It's just powerful, very powerful. Eric had a great way with blues and, and bending that blue note. Um, yeah, I learned a lot from him when I was a kid. I listened to him really intently. So there's an example of moving from major to minor that he did. Right? Major. Minor. Right? Uh, so any Mixolydian situation, it's fun that way because you can stay really pure with the Greek modes or you can go into the blues sound, you know, by, by pitting minor against major. Hmm. So there's that. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And and, and, so, and how does this relate to Get Back again? <laughs> because, well, first of all, Get Back is Mixolydian. Right. And if you listen, uh, well, let's get back to the key. So, uh, he even does a little bit of, I think he plays that third. I really do. I think he plays with it a little bit, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah. Now, 
there's that chord you're hearing when I go, right? So what this does, I, I look watching George, and he's playing A. Uh, so when you play that against an A chord, what you're getting is. And by the way, when they first uh, started working on that great moment uh, that I, I, I'm going to put it in the show notes. I posted it on Odyssey to avoid, you know, Apple going after me. Um, and I'll link it in the show notes. But uh, there's a great moment where Paul is is like bringing the song out of thin air, right? And you could hear him, he's playing with melodies, he's playing with melodies, and then he finally starts, something starts to form, and then you see the Beatles start to kick in and start feeling out the song a little bit. And uh, so you hear George going, uh, uh, get, uh, get back, get back, get back. Dude. So he plays a sharp nine chord, you know. Uh, I don't know what happened with that chord, if it was nixed or what went on with it, but uh, something happened. However, it was taken up by Billy Preston when he hit the... Because you're getting that again, okay? Now, the problem I have is we have two, cardinal, two t times Lennon broke one of my cardinal rules, which is making the minor ninth sound happen. And I remember, even as a kid, it bothered me when I heard his little... Because this... And that don't go together. But, you have any complaints about it? If you isolate it like that, yes. But, but, if, but in the song, to, it did not no, grate on me. No. no. Right, exactly. Exactly. Mm. So, you know, uh, again, I let it go. But I do think, I honestly believe that if they had done a real produced mm -hmm. version of the song, not a live band version, I think Paul would have picked up on it. I think he might have said, look, John, maybe uh, because properly you should go like that. Uh, well, let's see, what would it be? Yeah. Again, it doesn't sound that good. It really doesn't. <laughs> no, it doesn't. So there you go. Mm. Uh, hmm. So yeah, there, where else? I'm trying to remember now where else that happens. I can't remember now. So what, maybe if it comes to me, I'll get back to it. But uh, I want to bring up. A, <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah. Good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, another thing I want to bring up is you brought up to me, again, off camera at some point, the boomer bend, right? <laughs> Which is every guitar player from the 60s learned that bend and thought, cool, and it was exploited to death, okay? Now, I'm going to talk about boomer six. Now, in a rare moment, this is a very rare thing, Billy Preston copped a standard 60s style guitar move. And that's when they take a, a break. Get back, get back to where you once belong. That, that's what I'd call Boomer Six, because... I know personally, I, well, he's passed away since, but the guy who, uh, Bruce Langhorn, rest in peace, he uh, he was the uh, studio folk session guitarist in New York City back in the Dylan days, and he was Dylan's guy for, for a period. And uh, he exploited all these six, and it became a thing. People picked up on it because he was actually... Like, at least New York musicians knew of him, you know, uh, and his guitar style. So... Why am I thinking of the intro to I've Just Seen a Face? Um... Is that different? Well, Paul is doing something 
Remarkably advanced. Remember I told you, in your guitar lessons, we talked about um, the triads. And how to play all the triads, right? On three strings everywhere around the neck. All that stuff, right? The Beatles knew this a very long time ago, very early in their career. So it's interesting you bring this up. Yes, the reason why it's reminiscent of that particular song, I've Just Seen a Face, is that there are definitely six in there. But but what he's doing, he starts on a... Da, da, da. of the song right so we're on an E minor chord and he's doing the six that sits inside of an E minor chord which would be G up to E then he's doing the other six inside of an E minor chord which would be B up to G right and but the next one if he remained with six it wouldn't be quite right because it's on an E minor you want Right? And then he finally goes up to, which is the original six that started earlier up an octave, right? So, um, oh, sorry, active. Or, and I don't know the rest. I don't yeah, know if I really right. have it right. But he must have known what he was doing there then. That's the thing. Now, let's let's look at these triads. Now, here's a G, right? This part of the G from here to here is the sixth. Okay? Also, I'm sorry, we should be looking at E minor, though. I'm sorry. Here's an E minor triad shape. And there's the sixth inside of it. It's a minor sixth interval. Uh, now, this one... It's part of the E minor chord, right? So we're going from the third to the root in that case, and this is a major six now. So major six, minor six. Now, if we go to this triad shape, that's where he gets this, right? So he's he could have gone, right? He because he knew the triads, but he's picking the outside notes of each triad. Uh, Rather than that. So he wasn't probably thinking of sixths. He was just thinking, oh, I know this shape, and I'll pick the inside. Exactly. Inside. Right. Exactly. And when he jumped up on, you know, well, he's thinking here, he's thinking it's an E minor chord. How can I follow suit? So here you get a fifth, not a sixth, on the E minor. This, this root inversion of the E minor. Right? So... Yeah, anyway, yeah. <laughs> and that's our podcast on uh, I've Just Seen a Face. <laughs> well, you, you, well, getting back to get back, you have... That's a sixth, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that happens a lot. Um, six or just thirds. And, and what does Billy Preston play in that moment again? Right. Yeah. Uh, so let's see what. Where does that sit? Because what they do there is they stay on the D chord. Mm. Uh, get back. Get back. Get back to where you once belong. Right. And then back in. So he's he's doing six off of a D seven. Not a D major. Why? Why do I say that? Because he's going right there against a D chord. That's a D7, right? This, this, by the way, these Boomer Six were, uh, were, uh, I, I kind of, I'm, I'm getting used to that phrase now. I'm going to think of all sorts of Boomer cliches now in why music. Why not? Why not? Yeah, why not? Um, oh, what was I going to say? The Boomer 6 was used, oh, and and very often in Mixolydian situations, really commonly used in Mixolydian. 
So when I was learning the six and then I was learning the modes, I learned how to do the modes in six. Mm. Mm. So the, the Ionian, the Mixolydian, like that, you know. Why then Mixolydian six? Why do they go together? I, it was just, they liked the sound. It was really, I, there's no big theory reason okay. for it. They just liked the sound. They thought it <laughs> sounded cool, you know. All right. Just the way the flatted third and the blues sounds cool. Well, then I know? should give full credit for Boomer Bend to Tim Henson, who um, definitely needs our plug because no one will ever discover him. But uh, Tim Henson of Polyphia, if people want to check out, he was the one who apparently popularized the term. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't mind it. I mean, I'm a boomer, but, you know, I, it's whatever. It's descriptive. It's not pejorative. Yeah. Um, exactly. Uh, okay, sure. so actually this is a surprisingly fruitful song to mine for music theory. Okay, here's a question that I had then. The end. We often remark on Beatles songs having a really worked out, really interesting, surprising finish. This song does not. Yeah. In fact, how does it end? Get back. It just kind of ends. <laughs> oh, it just go. Oh, it ends on the Billy Preston lick. Yep. Yep. Exactly. And everyone else is kind of noodling a little bit. It's kind of. Yeah. 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 That's interesting because normally the Beatles are really, you know, big into the cool ending. Yeah. Do you think this is but, perhaps yeah. the time and the uh, it's live and uh, good enough? I think there was a lot of ah, good enough in this. I think there was a lot of that going on, honestly, you know. But, you know, I mean, commenting on the video itself, one thing that I, I really enjoyed was, all right, first there was, you know, at Twickenham, nobody seemed to be happy there, you know, none of them. Even Ringo looked glum. Paul cried. Paul and Ringo cried at one point, you know. Tears came to their eyes when that remarkable moment when Paul said, and then there were two. It was really sad. It was really sad. What blew me away was they, they go, this was such a, so remarkable to me, and it told me how tight these guys were with each other, that they, they met with, Paul, with George once after he left the band, right? Didn't work. Then they met with him a second time. Somehow it worked, and Oddly enough, as the, the planets lined up the right way, they wind up in Abbey Road Studios. When, when George comes back, it's a brighter, happier atmosphere. And what is one of the first things George says is good vibes, you know. And you see George no longer, you don't see a sign of animosity between him and Paul, not an, an iota of it. It's all gone. And, and similar with John, I think the guys were in a dismal place and they, you know, getting up early in the morning, it was dank, it was cold. You know, okay, this is something we should note, is that apparently it was the Let It Be film, the original Let It Be film, that implanted in people's minds that it was Paul and his, oh, no, I'll play anything you want or I won't play anything at all. It was that spat that led to George walking out. But apparently... In reality, apparently it was some sort of argument between George and John, which wasn't recorded, that was the immediate cause and on that particular day of George walking out. Where did you hear about this? So this has been talked about a lot. Um, and Is it on the Nagra? Well, I'm, I'm sure it's in there. I haven't listened to the whole 150 hours or whatever. Yeah. But... Um, they do mention it in the Get Back documentary when they're reading the newspaper reports about an argument between George and John that came to blows, and they're like, we didn't fight. Oh, there was no fighting or whatever. That was... they, they did have some argument, and the newspapers were reporting that they actually were throwing punches at each other. And they were saying, oh. that's not true. Can we sue for that? Right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, it's, but the Let It Be film kind of put it in people's mind because they showed that scene and then they show uh, George Lawrence. Right, so, right. So, oh. And even in this, I mean, I like the way Peter Jackson did it. It's just a, a series of quick cuts to George and John just kind of, uh, jo uh, John and Paul berating George or telling him don't play that or play this and it just cuts to George's reaction and <laughs> just keeps adding up and then and then he left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
But but as I think I might have said in our lesson last week or something off camera, um, uh, I I'm pretty sure there was uh, I, I uh, there was some sort of argument he was having with Patty at that time that she walked out. Right. So he might so have been in a bad was, way. It, it, there's with... all sorts of things going on that who knows? You know the real story mm-hmm. that we'll never be able to know because it wasn't on camera. Yeah, you know, this is all really, really, actually, from the social logistics of it all, it is very interesting, because when you talk about keeping John busy, and George step back and get back and just playing cowboy chords, like giving it all to John, there might have been a little talk on the side about that between Paul and George, who knows, you know? Yeah, who knows? It's f- endlessly fascinating for us, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I well, I know how band dynamics mm. go. You know, yeah. I've been in bands all my life. And, well, you uh, say there was no animosity after they came back to the uh, Apple Studios at Abbey Road, but there was that one really uncomfortable moment where they're talking. Paul is talking about his home footage of the uh, India trip. And he's describing it, and he's like, oh, right. John, you know, I could tell it, it wasn't, you weren't being you, and John was like, oh, I was trying to be a nice boy, and whatever. And it, they were talking about that, and it's like, oh, we should have just been ourselves. And then George is like, oh, well, that, we, I thought we went there to find who we are, or something like that, and everyone just shuts up. <laughs> right, that, right, right, right. I did pick, actually, yeah, I did pick up on that. Um, yeah. And obviously, George was so dedicated to the meditation thing and finding spiritual realization mm-hmm. that that's I think why they had to change Maharishi to Sexy Sadie. It's because right. George would not have been happy with that, right? Yeah, yeah. I wonder if no, and John, he probably sang it like that in front of George. Oh, I, I think it was. Yeah, wasn't? Did we get the demo of that? I don't know. Anyway. It definitely was sung that way until they went to record it, right? Yeah. I, oh, that'd be another interesting to find. That That's a, like an interesting piece to find out about. But, you know, uh, Matt Williamson from Pop Goes the Sixties has been doing this great series with this woman, Erin, I forget her last Clark name. Wilson, but I believe, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. And what would you call what she does? It's kind of like... Historiography. Historiography, right? So she analyzes books that were written about the Beatles and then talks about how they come from a bias or incomplete information, you know, that sort of thing. Um, It's like the history of the history of the Beatles. (laughs) Yeah. And I commented to Matt uh, on that one um, about uh, that, you know, it's interesting because a lot of these books are focusing on the the relationships the Beatles had with each other, when they got along, when they fought, you know, all these kind of like gossipy things. But uh, I I mentioned um, uh, Jeff Emmerich's book, Here, There, and Everywhere, and I said, yeah, you know, you could see that Jeff was slanted toward Paul, and he thought, George was an inept guitar player. You could see all this stuff, and he didn't like John that much, you know. But to me, the the historical importance of that book is his, the innovations that came up in the studio. So there's another kind of history you could look at, you know. And I thought, like, the Let It Be, uh, the Get Back movie can be actually made into a number of different movies, you know, how you edit it, you know. Absolutely. And right? then think of the 50-plus hours of footage we didn't see, right? We didn't see. You can yeah, make many yeah. different documentaries out of this, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, to drive the, the Gen Ys crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Call them Gen They're Y the for Beatles. start. <laughs> yeah. What's the big deal about the Beatles? <laughs> it's about the context. Yeah. Well. You had to be there. Hey, we know better. Um, okay, so if that exhausts the musical theory side of it, dot, dot, dot. All right, let me just check here if there's anything else. I talked about Mixolydian and Blues, the six the moves that John... Yeah, I think I think that's pretty yeah. much it. Paul's bass part is really basic rock. Right, okay, so let's talk about two things. And don't let me forget, because I want to talk about them both. One is the, the creation that we get to witness. And then two is the uh, the lyrics, the theme of the song. So let's talk a little bit about the creation, because you say um, 
for people who haven't seen it, you got it up on your Odyssey channel. You'll have the link, right? And people can check it out. Yeah, I'm going to put the link in the show notes, yes. And so for anyone who hasn't seen it, watch it because it shouldn't be. I mean, you've written many songs. I've written a few myself. So watching someone write a song shouldn't be that interesting or surprising. And yet it is. Because I don't, I mean, I have no idea and insight into anyone else's creative process. But for me, generally a song would start with a a lick, a chord movement, uh, something, a melody, whatever it is. And then you build on that and you try to find what goes with it. And it kind of comes together in pieces for me like that. But you're right. This one, he's just kind of aimlessly strumming around. And then he just kind of starts to pick up on some sort of vibe. And then he just starts audiating some sort of, I mean, just random melody. And then it starts to take shape. And then it just sort of appears. It is it is a bizarre and fascinating process that I think, I think a, a lot of people who don't do creative work have this really romantic idea about what creative work is like. And, oh, you know, you've got to channel the muse and it all comes to you in a flash of inspiration and all this, which is generally not true. But that's actually, what I think, what people are thinking of when they think of that creative process. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think from for me, I, well, what blew my mind was a transition from all this woo stuff to it, it almost it almost came together in an instant. Like when he finally found the melody, it was almost formed like really quickly. So I think what that was, that was stage because Theodore Adorno gave him the melody beforehand <laughs> and he had to act like. <laughs> I, don't, act like was I haven't it. checked with that crew, but I, I bet you that they're, I'm going to assume that the, the thing that the way they get around that is to say that, um, yeah, all the stuff that we didn't see them writing, of course, was Adorno and whatever. And because we can see, obviously see them writing these songs and crafting them and doing them in dozens of hours of footage. So this is real. This is what they can really do. And listen, it's so much inferior to the other stuff they were making before, right? Oh, right. That's, that'll be their argument, right? I'm that'll sure that'll be their argument. probably be their argument. Anyway. That'll probably... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But I will say this. I remember when I heard the story of Paul telling the story of being at some kind of Hollywoodish party with all these famous people. And he came up with uh, the Picasso song, drink to me, drink for my, you know, and I, re I rolled my eyes when he told that story. Cause I, I said, you know what? I could write a song like in front of people, no problem. And here's, here's the thing. I, I'm going to pin a badge on myself. When I was with my jam band, we were at a loss for material at one moment. So the guys are talking, and literally within 10 minutes, I came up with these progressions, right? Uh, all right, not so impressive. It's a four chord thing, you know. Uh, listen to the bridge. Now, this is my theory computer. whole string of chords I came up with in 10 minutes even I was amazed like did I just do that and it all came from music theory okay this was the idea now you notice it's kind of like an obtuse chord progression right well when I came up with this part it was actually a lot slower it was kind of like and it sounded to me like like a, a joking horror movie theme, you know, some sort of Frankenstein-y thing, you know, but, but with an edge of humor, maybe like Danny Elfman would do. But when I came to the bridge, I, you know, I did that and I thought, well, I'm going to need a bridge. And I started on C sharp half diminished, C sharp minor seven flat five. And I told myself what I'm going to do is I'm going to move the bass in a tritone 
and then a half step lower. And I'm just going to keep doing that till I come home. So I got... Once again, let me do that again. Pretty damn cool. But I will say this. I had no I couldn't for the life of me come up with a melody for either part of the song. If Paul was in the room, God bless him. He would have come up with a melody. That's the thing that impressed me about the moment. Is just, he was such a superb melodist. Yeah. It just flowed out of him like water. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, realistically, this song is the melody. I mean, yeah, musically yeah. speaking, there's not a lot happening here except for it's a great melody and a great hook. Yeah. And it's two notes. Get back, yeah. you know. But it's, it's yeah. Billy Preston that just makes it work, I think. He gives it, yeah, yeah, he, he really, it's so, I don't think that session would have been the way it was if it wasn't for him. You'll recall, I think, when we did our uh, Beatles trivia thing, <laughs> where I won. <laughs> uh, I think, that didn't Brock ask us, you know, what's, who is the fifth Beatle? And I think I said Billy Preston, and I, I stand by it. Uh, I, well, you're, uh-oh, we're frozen here. Uh, I'm okay. I see oh, okay. Uh, the, I'm of the mind that there are different fifth Beatles. Like, mm. there are about Fair 20 enough. different yeah. fifth Beatles. <laughs> there are a lot of I've candidates. always considered, yeah. I consider George Martin to be the fifth Beatle um, in ways because he took maybe three dimensions and brought it into four dimensions, you know. Um, Brian Epstein might have been the fifth business Beatle. You know, uh, so yeah, I you know, there's all this talk of who's the fifth Beatle. It's kind of ridiculous. It is, you know, when, but you know. Billy Preston is in the mix. We'll put it that way. Billy Preston definitely, and you know, if things had gone on, he might have become a be- an official. Well, John Beatle. suggested that he wanted that, yeah. and Paul immediately shot it down. Yeah, in fact, but John was going the whole hog, including the postage, because he's saying. And we could get this other guy and this other guy. We'll, we'll make it like this huge man. <laughs> I can see where Paul got a little. No, 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 no. We're the Beatles, man. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I can but imagine yeah, that, there was a uh, lot of trying to range on in in some of his wilder flights of fancy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what makes John so wonderful, though, is because he has like. He's a dreamer type. He's I like, like his he's idea a, for the set. Remember where they were talking about, like, what would the set look like? And he had, like, this idea, well, how about this, you know, hard plastic that we could be standing on and you could get the shots through? The transparent. Plastic. Right. Yeah. Transparent plastic, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It sounded like a cool idea. That There's John for you, mm-hmm. you know. Paul would never have thought of something like that. Yeah. That's, that's John's wild imagination. He, John is a poetic dreamer in a way. He, he has that quality. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm only sleeping kind of suggests that about him you know you know apparently that was a drug song huh. who yeah. knew yeah i i heard that too it was about uh heroin or something right well i think that would have been the acid phase lying there i'm staring at the ceiling waiting for that sleepy feeling yeah it's just well all right it's just very hard to sleep on acid from well i think experience. he means the dream state but anyway y- yeah the dream state yeah yeah so yeah. Um, All right, get back. Get back. Uh, oh, I, oh, the, I, the theme. So the lyric, the theme. So, I mean, who can ever say? But it must have been the idea of getting back must have been swirling around in their minds at that time. And well, you notice that point. those words, yeah. specifically, not just the melody, but those words formed in that creative session in the first twenty minutes or whatever when he's throwing around. Right. He had those words. Get back. Get back. So it was something in there. Yeah, uh, yeah, get back, right, exactly. Uh, getting And they, in a sense, they did get back with that session because they were originally a live band and they, they wanted to get back to that, you know, right. or at least Paul did. And they were going I, back to, like, the one after 909 and these other songs they wrote when they were kids. 
because they're right. getting back. Right? Yeah. So it must yeah. have been in their subconscious at the very least. Well, I do know that they had this thing for childhood nostalgia uh, by the, when they started tripping because acid has a tendency to do that for some reason. I think my belief is that I don't know if you remember what it was like to be a little kid, say three years old and, and looking out at the world and everything was big and colorful. It was like carnival like almost it was almost too much to take in. I had like a cartoonish quality to it. Acid does that. It exaggerates colors and, and sounds. So they sound like, I don't know, uh, like almost like caricature versions of the, th of the thing you're experiencing, you know? And I think maybe that acid evokes that same sense, you know, that you had as a child. So they both wanted to get back to childhood when they were at Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane. That was already there, you know. Yeah. Uh, this this one is more solid and concrete feeling, get back. It feels like, you know, like, let's play rock and roll again. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's play live again, yeah. you know. And uh, props to Peter Jackson for including the white power <laughs> version of this song, <laughs> which I understand went around as a bootleg for many years as like the white power Beatles. Like, hey, they were secretly racist or something. <laughs> I don't know. I don't whoa, know how this whoa, got passed around. Whoa, you're going to have to back So there's up that here. whole segment where they show um, they're experimenting with like, you know, get back uh, Pakistanis or whatever. They're singing those oh, right. kinds of lines, and they're showing the headlines that were at the same time of, you know, immigrant, uh, anti-immigrant rallies and things taking place in Britain. So they were doing a kind of satire type of thing, uh, throwing that out there, like, oh, go oh, get back, pure, immigrants, you know. Yeah, it was pure sarcasm. Right. Paul even said, this is a pro, he goes, I was thinking of making a protest song out of this, and that's right. why... But oh, I think on, I think that was passed around non-ironically as a bootleg in the back in the day. Oh, yeah. so the Beatles, yeah, 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 the guys who who wouldn't play in stadiums in America if they were segregated. Yeah, they're real racist. The <laughs> yeah. Beatles, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. I mean, the Beatles were confounded by racism mm -hmm. in America. They could, didn't understand why it was happening at all. It was mm -hmm. like, what do you guys, you know, why are you guys like this, you know? So yeah. But yeah, but they did go through thing. a lot of different lyrics, and there was a lot of work on it just to get the the final form here. Uh, he, and an interesting, weird thing about the lyrics. Obviously, John and Paul were at a phase where lyrics could be anything. Uh, you know, we don't care. You know, like just weird. Uh, dig a pony. pony. Yeah. Right. What's it mean exactly? You know, uh, it doesn't. You know. But I heard, I read somewhere a, a while ago that John, and it was a direct quote from John, saying something like he was paranoid about the song Get Back, that he thought Paul was writing, Jojo was him, and Loretta was Yoko. And he was like writing a derogatory song mm -hmm. about them. <laughs> Seeing Get Back, that makes no sense no. to me, because John is part, no. like, but this is John said it. Yeah. Yet he was participating in building the lyrics with Paul. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. But projection, right? Because Dig a Pony was, was called and was known as All, All I Want Is You, because that was the hook, that was the thing he had written, and then the rest is just whatever words. Yeah, cares. right. All I Want Is You, Everything Has Got To Be The Way You Want It To, is John singing to Paul. Did I just blow your mind or no? <laughs> I, I'm not so sure I buy into that. I, the Why more you think you about that? it, the more I think you'll see. Um, this is So there's the whole, speaking of historiography in the Beatles, there's the whole reimagining that's going on right now in certain Beatles podcast spaces about Paul uh, and John and their relationship and all of that. But um, I think the argument they're making is that John was in love with Paul whether literally romantically or, you know, less less literally, but at any rate, was singing to him a lot. And well, everything uh, has got everything has got to be the way you wanted to, because clearly Paul. That, that was sounds there. sarcastic to me. That sounds like sarcasm because Paul John always complained about how we became Paul's backup band. Right. Yeah. So that's what I, so I think that's the reference, right? 
he's that's what he's saying. He's saying, Paul, everything's got to be the way you want it to. But in a sarcastic way? No. In the real straightforward way. John wasn't being sarcastic when he said that we became the bad guy. That's what he felt like, right? Which you actually get to see a little bit of at the very end where they're doing Let It Be 18,000 times. <laughs> and they finally get one right. in the can. And then John's like, okay, right. I think we're done. And he's like, Paul's like, oh, I think we can do one more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, they became the backup band for Paul McCartney. Everything has got you to be the think way you want he, it to. Wow, I, I'm seeing this in a totally different light because I always assumed that John was bitter about the fact that they became Paul's backup band. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. And I think that's what that... I think he did like Paul and want to be with him, but here's the thing that I don't like. Oh, I see. Okay, so the phrase is kind of split in half. Yeah, All I want is I you. Think. Like I think, yeah. Uh-huh, Who knows? It's just an interpretation. Yeah. Let people fight it out in the comments. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. yeah, what do you think, folks? <laughs> if if indeed you've gotten this far in the podcast. Uh, but yeah, but, I mean, as you say, John was helping to come up with the lyrics for Get Back. I mean, everyone was kind of chipping in. And Tucson, yeah. Arizona? Sure, yeah. So I think that that's kind of uh, the fact that he said that. If he really did, I'm assuming he did, I seem to remember reading it somewhere i don't remember where i definitely have heard that before he thought he was singing to yoko Get back. yeah 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 but I, you know like when you watch the process it's really obvious that he's not singing to anyone i you know yeah well who knows what mental space john was in at the time or at well, the time that he thing. was giving the interview where he said that you know that's the thing, man. I'm sure, uh, aside from the heroin, I'm sure they were still smoking weed. That's one thing they didn't let go of for a long, long mm. time. Even Paul, when he left the band, was still smoking weed. Yeah. Um, oh, it's still to this day, right? Yeah. Now, weed has the ability to, like, really make you paranoid. You know, all well, the people are thinking this about me. You know, I'm getting this vibe from this person, you know. So it could have come from that. Who knows? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, let's get back, folks. So, um, James, you know, earlier we had a guitar lesson. I talked to you about um, how on, on bar chords to take, to make sure to, to be able to, and often, right? An example is John Solo, in a way. Because I, I, you know, I was wondering where he, see, what happens is uh, that part is a D major pentatonic, not A major, right? So when you look at the D major, so he was training the song, you know, uh, 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 actually, no, he didn't do it on the D chord. But anyway, my point being, oh, yeah, it's the other, <laughs> I finally thought of it. The other uh, breaking of the Cardinal rule was, now this is really subtle, and you're going to get pissed off at me for even bringing this up. But, all right, against the A7, right? But then when it switches chords... Uh, so you get uh, right but that A is considered to be uh, we're on a D chord and it's considered to be D7 really because you have, you have that right you have the flat 7 but he does the lick dissonance it's not the minor ninth because now it's, it's flip-flopped it would have been if it was like this right but i thought if it was really following blues protocol it would be it would have been uh, uh sorry and then Me being picky, and I know. <laughs> I, 
I am gonna be angry at you for pointing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, shut up. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's boomer theory. <laughs> I hear it when you isolate it. Um, so what's the inversion of a minor ninth? A major seventh. That, oh, uh, that's not bad. Yeah, yeah. Major seventh is, for some reason, it's not as harsh as... And I don't know why that is. The odd thing is, you can eventually avert... You could... Invert again. You could go from minor ninth to major seventh to minor second. See, because when I do this or when I do this, it's F sharp and G, right? So, right. Oh, right. Now yeah, that's yeah, a, yeah. I get you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Right. So, and and that interval, you would think, oh, you'd never use that in anything. It's horrible. But wait a second. Um, how about that one? There's another one. Now listen inside the context of a of a minor add nine chord. Right? Somehow, again, like you said, the context is everything. Yeah. Weird. Right? And there are chords that that interval will sound absolutely awful in. Don't mm. get me wrong. I can imagine. You yeah. know. But again, you know, if you're surrounded by dancing virgins, for some reason it sounds great. <laughs> <You know? laughs> that is a quote. I think we should make that the quote of the episode here. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a good song title. I gotta, I gotta write that song. Yeah, I want to hear that song. <laughs> All right. Well. Yeah, get I back, everybody. We, uh, <laughs> get back. Get back. Yeah. And uh, yeah, get back to uh, actually having a warm, wonderful Christmas holiday. You know, so find. Uh, here's this. my question, my final question then. Because you said you were very yeah. much looking forward to this Get Back documentary. You could feel the Beatles were going to set the world on fire once again. This is going to change people's hearts and minds. Are you feeling it? That's a great. I well, I can. I didn't think of it quite like that. I saw it as an omen. Ah, the Beatles. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Yeah, you know, enough. because the Beatles arrived in America after John Kennedy was shot, and America was mourning and was sad, but the Beatles managed to cheer the country up, and um, now that we're living in such a restricted crazy environment the world is so insane right now it's very dark and i see the beatles like they're coming they came back they got back to us and i feel like somehow it's an omen of maybe not right away but something good may happen down the line and you know what i you know despite <laughs> Love James Pilato, don't get me wrong, but, you know, despite him going off and saying all that depressing stuff, I will say this. There's an immutable law of reality, and the Hermeticists talk about it, that the pendulum must swing. It must swing. It can't not swing. It would defy physics altogether. So right now, it's almost pinned. You know, it's really almost pinned. It has to swing back to something better. It must there's, there's no way around that. So with and that in we mind, can sing I want to better. Uh, yeah, right. With that beautiful opening chord. Yeah, anyway. I use that as an alarm. It's a great alarm chord. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a little akin to uh, the opening chord to uh, Hard Day's Night, too. You just cannot turn off the musical theory switch. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it, man. <laughs> you know, maybe what, the next lifetime I'll come back as a musician. <laughs> right. You'll get back <laughs> as a Bach theorist to bring it all yeah. full circle. All right. Yes. Get Bach. <laughs> right. By the way, if you haven't seen it, there's a great documentary on Bach. 
called A Life of Passion worth seeing? You talking to me? <laughs> I haven't seen it. I, I will. I'll check it out. Yeah, it's on YouTube. You could find it on YouTube. Uh, I doubt you could find it on Odyssey at this point, but uh, definitely on YouTube. So anyway, I do want to bring up again the moment where Paul comes back. You know, Paul is writing it back. It comes out of thin air. I, I clip that out of the documentary and I put it on my Odyssey website, on my Odyssey channel. So uh, I'm going to link to that. So... And I can't think of any other links aside from the usual, except maybe if you have a link to that guy that came up with the Boomer Bend, I'd be happy to oh, link yeah. to him. Yeah, yeah, I will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that'll be it, uh, James. Uh, of course, I'll see you before Christmas. But uh, to all our viewers out there, have a very Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. And just keep your eyes on good things to come. No. Merry Crimble. Merry Crimble, yeah. <laughs> oh, speaking of which, just one more moment. Okay, one more moment. So, you know, being a lonely bachelor, and my, most of my family's gone, and what's left is on the East Coast, and I can't get out there. Every day, I go down from my bachelor studio apartment and go down to the lobby and there are all these packages for people. And I thought to myself, you know, every day I see all these packages. And I don't bother to look, you know, see if I got one. And then that one, one day I walked down there, I, I looked, and I literally shook my head. And I said, well, here's one guy that's never going to get a package in the mail for Christmas. I looked down at that moment. I literally at that moment, and I saw like this big white envelope, fluffy package with my name on it. And I brought it upstairs, and lo and behold, it was my friend Larry. And what he sent me for Christmas was this little Christmas tree. And if you look closely, you could see the beetles are the ornaments. <laughs> right? And every year, I never have a Christmas tree because my apartment's too small. But now this year, I could say I actually have a Christmas tree. That's awesome. So I'm really happy. Thank you, Larry Lang. That's really awesome of you. <laughs> So, yeah. Nice. So, Merry Crimble. Yeah, Merry Crimble. All right. <laughs> and happy eggnog. All right, James. Yeah, happy eggnog. No, really, everybody, have a wonderful, warm holiday. Make the best. Be with your family. Make the best. Just feel warm. Forget all about the bad stuff and just enjoy the people you love and want to be with. That's what I have to say. James, take care, my man. Thank See you, you. next week. <laughs>